Hello, and thank you for tuning in. I'm James Cleveland. Tonight, we have a special guest with us, Daryl Perry. And I'm Allie Havens. Welcome to the show, Daryl. In local news tonight, Keene personal injury lawyer Timothy O'Meara was disbarred by the New Hampshire Supreme Court for unethical behavior. O'Meara pressured a Hampton family into a $2 million fee for an $11 million settlement after the Hampton woman was left paralyzed. He had no authority to act on the family's behalf. The Supreme Court ruled that disbarment was necessary to, quote, protect the public and preserve the integrity of the legal profession because Amir, quote, selfishly allowed his own personal interests to take precedence over his duty of loyalty to his clients, unquote. And he also lied to a panel, to a panel during arbitration in this case. Yeah, one, one thing I find interesting uh, about this situation, it actually happened in Pennsylvania, so I'm really not clear uh, why New Hampshire is involved, but... I believe I, he had a license to practice in New Hampshire, so now he's lost his license. Yeah, I guess that, that does make sense. So. Uh, but I, something I thought was interesting is that he was disbarred to protect the uh, public and preserve the integrity of the legal profession, which I don't... In my understanding of the legal profession, there's not much integrity to save. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> So uh, I think that's kind of a lost cause there. But I do respect that, uh, you know, this is fraud in this case because he was uh, supposed to be representing these people that he wasn't actually representing. Right. There's definitely fraud in that he was claiming to represent someone that he had no authority to represent. Mm -hmm. And then he essentially extorted them for $2 million. So if you're going to be unethical in one jurisdiction, you're probably going to be unethical in every jurisdiction. Right. So... Uh, I think disbarment is probably a good thing. Right. Uh, and some people uh, might not want to press charges, even if they uh, do have some terrible injury involved. They might choose not to press charges. And if uh, you know ambulance chaser comes after and they decide to anyway without your permission, then you know I think that that's wrong. Right. And it would be interesting if we actually had a free market with competing court systems that weren't run by the government, mm -hmm. how a situation like this would be handled. And I believe, you know, in this case, it would probably be very similar to where he would lose his right or his privilege right. to practice law and represent families. Right. Well, he might not even likely to try something like this in a free market because, uh, you know, complete, yeah, just reputation killer. Uh, and you're also less likely to get caught with these kinds of things in the current system. Uh, it's probably, he probably got away with doing things like this for a while, and this is just the first that anyone's ever heard of it. Exactly. Yeah, it's very surprising that he was even disbarred to me. Uh, usually, when I think of like the legal system, it's politicians that were former lawyers and, you know. Revolving like, door. Yeah, they protect their own, so it's, it's very surprising that he actually got punished. In state news this evening, the New Hampshire Board of Education has denied funding for new charter schools due to overspending of $5 million in the last two years. This moratorium affects several charter schools in the pipeline for 2013 and 2014. According to Deputy Educational, Education Commissioner Paul Leather, quote, charter schools can still be approved if they secure local funding sources. According to a tape of the Wednesday meeting, the state board took about seven minutes to deal with the issue. Leather brought it up, risked in a few board members made statements and the moratorium was voted in. Leather said state education officials and had, discussion, had discussed a moratorium as one of several options to handle the budget problem. His department made no recommendation and the decision on the moratorium was made by the Board of Education. Uh, this is disappointing because I would really like to see New Hampshire adopt, uh, you know, be more open to charter schools. I think that that's important to have competition as far as the schools go. Well, charter schools aren't really competition because they're still paid for by taxpayer funds. Well, as far as so, there's more competition involved in the charter school system than in just plain old public schools. They, well, they, as far as where you send the child within the system, mm -hmm. but it's still government funded and you know there is right. no option of whether or not you fund that particular school. That's true. If the, government were not involved in education at all, then it would be even more open mm -hmm. and parents would have even more control over their, their I agree. That would be child. that would be, you know, we were discussing before the show, don't let perfect be the enemy of good. 
And uh, I think that as far as I've seen, charter schools are better than no charter schools. Yeah, the advantage is they're competing for the dollars. And so if they don't do your, their job, uh, in theory, the parents could remove their children from a failing school system where you don't have that option in a public school system. Right. A lot of a lot of parents are left, you know, they don't want to send their kids to public schools beca because they see the terrible results coming out of public schools. So they're left with homeschooling, unschooling options. And a lot of people don't have time for that. And, you know, they don't feel qualified to be educating their kids. And these charter schools do a lot better job than the public schools or a parent might. Yeah, I don't remember exactly where it was, but I think it was uh, New Orleans, Louisiana. They actually have a lottery where parents try to enter into get their children into the charter schools. I mean, it's just, it's ridiculous. And people are crying when they don't win the lottery. Right. Well, they, yeah, before uh, Katrina, from what I understand about the situation in New Orleans, they uh, didn't used to have charter schools, or at least not to the extent they do now. And after Katrina, it was sort of their only option. And now no one wants to go back. It was supposed to be a temporary thing. But everyone's like, this is way better than before. That's true. The school system, you know, that's the one good thing or one good thing that came from Katrina. You know, they were able to start anew with their school system. Mm -hmm. It is important uh, that people are, that there is some competition, even if people aren't willing to abol abolish the public school system, the, you know, forced uh, curriculum of the public schools that people could have an option for charter schools. It's just another way to go about it, and it does increase competition to, to some extent. I mean, I'm all for school choice, but there are some people that they just get the impression that somehow a charter school is not still a public school. Oh, it is. It, still, it is still a public school. Right. It is still paid for by tax dollars. It is still paid for by tax dollars, and they can take donations as well. But uh, they are accountable for the pro what, what they produce as far as an education. Whereas the public schools now, uh, they're not responsible for that, or the non-charter public schools. It, th there's no accountability, as th th no one's checking to make sure that they're doing a good job. The kids are forced to go to that school based on where they live. Right. And so, uh, you know, it's, it's more compulsory. Uh, now we have a video of Libertarian Party presidential candidate Gary Johnson endorsing the Free State Project. What is your opinion on the Free State Project? Yeah, go Free State Project. Wow, what a model, what a terrific model. When I was governor of New Mexico, <coughs> the, the Free State Project came to my attention because the Free State Project, and for those watching here that uh, don't know what that is all about, I'm not going to get this exactly right, but it's basically... 30,000 people who have said they're going to relocate in some area of the United States, get elected to all the elected offices, and uh, basically hands off when it comes to the government. Very, very, very uh, libertarian, if not uh, anarchist, and anarchist being complete government void, no government. Well, terrific. Um, I wanted to see that happen in New Mexico. It's now happening in New Hampshire. Um, you know, good thing, really terrific thing. I, I just applaud the Free State Project. Uh, I, I look forward to uh, successes from the uh, Free State Project that the rest of the country uh, emulates. Yeah, one, one thing that uh, I find interesting about the Free State Project, um, I may be wrong on this, but I don't think there's ever been, maybe there's been one libertarian actually elected to a state rep position you're talking like a whole there, national... There have been half a dozen throughout the history of the Libertarian Party. At one time, New Hampshire had, I believe, five or six. Oh, actually in New Hampshire? In New Hampshire. And then the Republican and Democratic parties doubled or tripled the signature requirements for a minor party to get on the ballot. And they doubled the vote test well, for I guess a minor my, party to remain on the ballot. My point, uh, I mean, I think we've had 14 state reps um, elected in the the history of the Free State Project, I may be wrong on that figure, it may be different now, but I mean that, you're talking like a matter of like five years, that is so much success compared to 50 years, or maybe not 50, but 40, 40 with the Libertarian Party, you know, it's just, I don't see any results from that. Well, the members of the FSP that have been elected to the State House, they're getting elected as Republicans and Democrats, 
-hmm. So they don't have the ballot access hurdle to jump over to get on the ballot. That's one thing I don't understand is the two major parties getting to make up rules about uh, how third party, you know, what are the requirements for third party candidates to get on the ballot? Right. Because obviously there's a conflict of interest there. Uh, well, one would think that there's definitely a conflict of interest. If I'm a Republican or a Democrat, I'd rather just have, you know, one enemy, the opposite party. I, would, I don't right. want to have a third party getting in my way, so I'm going to make it as difficult as possible to allow them to get ballot access. Right. This is this not obvious to people? And, and then in a lot of jurisdictions, they gerrymander the district so that they make it safe for either themselves or one of their fellow party oh, members. Oh, no, no, no. That, gerrymandering, that's illegal. <laughs> Actually, gerrymandering is legal and encouraged in certain circumstances. Mm -hmm. There are districts in some of the southern states that, due to interpretations of the Voting Rights Act of 1965, states that there must be a majority-minority district, mm. which yep. means that and we're both from Alabama, so the 7th right. district of Alabama it's a majority minority district right roughly 80 percent of the people living in that district are african-american yeah. which means that a democrat will always get elected from that district right and if they ever try to change that district it will be thrown out by the courts because gerrymandering in that circumstance is encouraged mm -hmm. yeah i do remember if you look at how the districts are distributed it's you know there's a big chunk here and then a little chunk up here and and a little two inch yeah. <laughs> strip of land that connects those two <laughs> right yeah we will give credit to the libertarian party uh, of any third party they had the most ballot access hands down yes i mean like the green party well and the lp also has several hundred elected people at different county and municipal levels across the country and no other third party has that that's yeah, very true in health news tonight, in response to a recent investigation that found substantial levels of arsenic in rice and many rice-based products, a group of Democrats proposed legislation that would impose federal limits on the dangerous element. Representatives Rosa DeLauro of Connecticut, Frank Pallone of New Jersey, and Nita Lowy of New York said in a joint statement that their bill would require the Food and Drug Administration to set a maximum amount of arsenic permissible in foods containing rice. The move is based on a consumer report's finding this week urging consumers to cut back on rice ingestion after researchers discovered worrisome traces of the inorganic arsenic in products including brown and white rice, rice-based infant cereals, pastas, drinks, and crackers. Inorganic arsenic is known as a carcinogen for humans. Organic arsenic is less, less toxic but still of concern, according to the product testing group. The federal government has an obligation to every American family to ensure the food they consume is safe and should not make them sick, DeLauro said in a statement. Uh, the federal government has an obligation to make sure that our food is safe. Now, I don't know about, some people are lactose intolerant, some people are addicted to peanuts, some, some foods are safe for me but not safe for you. So how is the Food and Drug Administration going to keep all of us safe? They can't keep anyone safe. And they know that they can't keep anyone safe. That's why they're always recalling these different foods once they find, oh, this spinach is bad, so don't eat spinach from Mexico or mm -hmm. wherever it was a few years ago. And then you know they would find out something, else. oh, don't eat this thing. Right. And now they're saying there's worrisome levels of arsenic in rice. Any amount of arsenic in my rice is worrisome. <laughs> well, I think that... I, from what I understand, there's like arsenic that's it's pretty prevalent element that, you know, it's the dosage that, that counts. But the thing about this story is a consumer reports finding. Now, I support things like consumer reports and uh, right, they're a non -government third, organization. Party, third party organizations. Find, you know, the Food and Drug Administration wasn't responsible for finding out about the arsenic and the rice. Right. They're just mm -hmm. responsible for making up the mandate. And... Uh, the consumer reports finding urged cons customers to or consumers to cut back on intake. They didn't say, you know, they they weren't calling for some mandate on rice companies or whatever. They're not saying don't eat any more rice. Yeah, just, 
You might want to cut back because there's you, this worrisome yeah. level. If you're eating ton, if you're eating eating tons of rice every day, you might want to think about it because you could be you know get arsenic po poisoning. Well, let, let's look at other things that the FDA approves, such as every medication that you see the ads for mm -hmm. on television, and then they have to read off the list of side effects. And a lot of times the side effects are worse than what you're taking the medicine for. Right. You know, there's an asthma medicine that causes shortness of breath. <laughs> and that's why you're taking the asthma medicine. <laughs> there are some diet pills that cause anal leakage. Mm -hmm. I would rather be <laughs> chunky than have that as a side effect. Yeah, it's not but too good. But these are approved by the FDA because the way the FDA is set up for drug approval you have to pay a bunch of money to the FDA, do some tests, and then it costs a lot of money to do the test, and then you sort of, you know, slide a couple billion dollars over to right. the FDA. Oh, okay, yep, drugs approved. Yeah, on the, on the other hand, though, sometimes it takes like 20 years for a drug to be approved to actually get to market. So if you, let's say you have a disease and you actually want the drug that's available in India, you cannot legally get it in America. Right. Uh, you know, everyone, no one wants uh, there to be arsenic in people's rice. No one wants that. And the rice companies don't want to poison their cu customers. You know, this is not, uh, this is not, you know, the biggest of fears, but no one wants to feel like their food is being poisoned. Uh, but also, you don't want to let your understanding that there is a government agency called the FDA out there that's supposed to protect us. Uh, you don't want to let that that influence your decisions so that you think that everything is safe. Right. And having a government agency set up called the Food and Drug Administration, it gives people that uh, feeling that there's a safety net there of, I can just buy whatever and it's okay because it's all approved by this government agency. Mm -hmm. People don't really have to think about what's good, what's bad or be cautious of there might be something not safe in this food. Yeah, speaking of government safety, in national news, President Obama wins the right to indefinitely detain American citizens under the National Defense Authorization Act. Two weeks ago, a federal judge ruled that a temporary injunction on Section 1021 of the NDAA for fiscal year 2012 must be made permanent, essentially barring the White House from ever enforcing a clause in the NDAA that can let them put any U.S. citizen behind bars indefinitely over mere allegations of terrorist associations. On Monday, the U.S. Justice Department asked for an emergency stay on that order, and hours later, U.S. Court of Appeal, uh, hours later, U.S. Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit, Judge Raymond Lawyer said agreed to intervene and place a hold on the injunction. The stay will remain in effect until at least September 28th, when a three-judge appeals panel is expected to begin addressing the issue. So this has been some really, really unpopular uh, legislation, the, uh, the NDAA. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's, it's something that I think a lot of liberals never expected from Obama, that he would be pushing for so hard. Well, and there's an NDAA passed every year. It's the National Defense Authorization Act, which essentially says, here's the money that we're going to put out to keep the military active for the next year. And there's this one particular provision that was slipped into the bill that was passed at the end of last year to authorize for this year that basically said that the military shall have the right to detain people under these cer right. certain circumstances, but the military cannot detain a U.S. citizen. But the way the provision is written, it does not say that the FBI, the CIA, the DEA, or any other number of federal or state agencies can't detain a U.S. citizen for any reason. And it's specifically written so that anyone connected to terrorism right. or terror suspects can be detained. Right. Which there are a lot of journalists that report on terror activity that have connections that are connected to Al Qaeda or Hezbollah or Hamas. So there's the potential for reporters who are doing innocent work to be indefinitely detained just because they have connections just to people involvement. that are connected to these organizations. So you were saying that 
the NDAA, that's like an every year sort of thing. Yes. And that this one's just super controversial because, because of the way of it's written. Because of the two provisions. So that's just interesting to me because, yeah, I mean, I knew that they, uh, you know, every year that the military gets a little bit more tyrannical um, or gets a little bit more leeway in what they can do. But uh, I didn't realize that it was sort of the same phrase in the same way. The in this year's NDAA asked for more leeway for the military. Well, what did it, they put these different provisions in? And why does this the, NDAA, the NDAA? Well, the NDAA itself is basically we're funding the military for the next year, mm -hmm. and then different politicians add in different amendments. Sometimes they slip stuff in when it's being written. And that's where the problems come in because nobody knows who added this into the original right. bill. Yeah, what's striking if, too, um, President Obama signed it on New Year's Eve. Basically, after saying that he would veto the bill because of true. that provision. So he, he basically snuck it in, everyone's out partying, and he signs this, uh, this bill in. Now's my chance. Right. Well, and one of the problems is the fact that Congress is able to combine these unrelated pieces of legislation giving the military the right or the authority to indefinitely detain people, it slipped into a funding bill that yeah. they know everybody will vote for. Why? Yeah, exactly. Why is uh, the National Defense Authorization, Authorization Act, why are there provisions allowing CIA and non-military organizations well, to, it, to indefinitely detain citizens? Here's something that most people aren't aware of. Back in 2006, the real ID was slipped into a completely unrelated funding bill. There was a provision a couple years ago to ban online poker that was slipped into a bill for port safety. Mm -hmm. It was called the Safe Ports Act. So Congress does this all the time because they're not required to pass bills one subject at a time. They're not required right. to read the bills. Right, if you're looking for laws pertaining to a certain subject, you could have these bills that are totally, you know, the titles and what they're based on, they're not organized. Right. Uh, they're just, like you're saying, well, they're just they, slipping they in give, things when it's convenient. They, they give the bills really funny names to get people to support them, such as the Patriot Act. Or it's actually the USA Patriot right. Act. <laughs> In international news, protests are still raging worldwide over the Innocence of Muslims video. My husband just left with the caravan. Yes. Go and wait for me in your tent. I'm coming. Isn't it shameful for a woman to expose herself to a man she does not know? Have you not heard what God has said in the Quran? The master may desire whom he wants, and shall be given whom he wants. God is true in all that he says in the book. Also, if a married woman offers herself to the master, and he wishes to have her, he is allowed, even if the rest of the believers are not allowed. Everything Allah says in the Quran is true. How pleasurable is our Islamic ways. Sky News reported that two movie theaters in Peshawar, Pakistan, were set on fire amid the latest protests against an anti-Islam film, Innocence of Muslims. The Pakistani government declared a, quote, special day of love for the Prophet Muhammad. It is said the, quote, what the goal was to motivate the country's peaceful majority and not allow extremists to turn protests into a display of anger. Meanwhile, the U.S. government has paid for commercials on Pakistani TV in which President Barack Obama condemns the film. We now have a letter from uh, a business associate of, from Egypt, uh, one of Daryl's associates. Yes, a business associate of mine named Ahmed El Faiki from Cairo, Egypt, posted this on his Facebook, and I'm just going to read some excerpts from it. It says, I feel it is my duty to apologize and to tell you what happened. He says, there are extremists in every religion. Some Muslim extremists support Al-Qaeda. The Quran states there is no excuse for killing innocent civilians. Thus, killing the innocent, the innocent ambassador cannot be justified by Islam. Around two to 3,000 demonstrators went to the embassy to protest on 9-11, which will make Americans think they were celebrating 9-11. Some of them support Al-Qaeda 
enchanted for Osama bin Laden, which shows how ignorant they are. Most of us are condemning what is happening at the embassy and condemning as well the murder of the innocent ambassador in Libya. Most of us are against Al-Qaeda and believe they are bad for Islam. I don't have any hatred in my heart for Americans, and I hope they don't hate me. I apologize to you. Let's love. Let's fight hatred everywhere. This was the message of my prophet, whom these idiots at the embassy are claiming to follow. Wow, that's, uh, yeah, I think that it is pretty unpopular, these violent protesters. I don't think that that represents a majority in any, in any sense. Right, and just like the actions by the U.S. military do not represent my beliefs. Exactly. Now, I, I don't support killing innocent people just because they happen to practice the same religion or live in the same area as some people that you know have committed terrorist acts against the U.S. Right. I certainly hope that people in the Middle East don't uh, think that what the United States is doing over in their countries think that that is a reflection of my beliefs because they certainly aren't. I don't support anything the military is doing in the Middle East. Yeah, that's very true. Um, I think it is important. A lot of people just think um, this is a war on Islam. That's basically what a lot of people think it boils down to. But uh, I think you guys are right. It's a very diverse group of people over there. And you can't just lump them all in and say, oh, well, they hate us all. Right. It would be really convenient to make this about religion, wouldn't it? Well, uh, there are over a billion people that are Muslims. And, you know, it really touched me that, you know, this associate of mine, felt the need, and he actually called it his duty to apologize. You know, that, I don't think that he has any duty to right, apologize. But, you know, for, that, that just touched me because it's one man apologizing for an entire, you know, one-seventh of the world population. Right. Yeah, you know, um, that, that's just amazing that he felt it was his duty to apologize for the actions of a few. I mean, if we are fighting a war on Islam, we're losing because that is the world's fastest growing religion. And every year there's more and more... Um, people who practice Islam. Right, and more and more people moving out of the United States. So the United States is growing less popular because of its involvement in the Middle East. But anyway, thank you for joining us tonight. We hope you enjoyed the show. Join us again next week for another installment of Shire TV for more news and analysis. I'm James Cleveland. And I'm Allie Havens. May you each find happiness, peace, and prosperity. Shh.